Jamie DeWolf is a performer, filmmaker, writer, live event producer, arts educator, and circus ringmaster from Oakland, California, whose films have won over 35 international awards. He's written and performed with inmates at San Quentin Penitentiary, won Performance of the Year by NPR's Snap Judgment, was voted Best Poet and Best Filmmaker from the East Bay Express. Jamie has led writing workshops at over 90 universities, high schools, and juvenile detention facilities nationwide. He also coached the Youth Speaks Slam team two years in a row, bringing them to the Brave New Voices finales, which was also featured on HBO. As one of the most in-demand variety show hosts in the Bay Area and beyond, he's a regular MC and curator for circus troops, vaudeville showcases, and music festivals across the U.S. There sincerely is so much more to say about Jamie's artistic biography and breadth, but you'll just have to go to his website for that, and that is listed in the podcast notes below. For the purposes of this podcast, Jamie wears a different hat that's linked to his birth legacy, that of L. Ron Hubbard as his great-grandfather, the founder of Scientology. I want to keep this introduction short, and I also must say that it was an absolute delight to speak with Jamie. Well, really human to human, but also I personally had insights as I listened to him speak about content and cultic principles that he is so well versed in. He was never a Scientologist himself, but has an incredibly deep understanding of not just Scientology as an organization and legacy, but the patterns that exist across such groups. I'm sure you too will find Jamie's perspective thought-provoking, if not enlightening, as it is obvious that he has personally been rigorous in considering and pursuing the deconstruction of established beliefs and paving his own path through the lens with which he chooses to see the world. Thank you for that, Jamie. Right, so welcome Jamie DeWolf to the Project Hope podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. So Jamie, if it's all right, I wanted to begin by just asking you a little bit, this might be difficult, giving you a challenging task here, kind of high level family history, and of course your connection into the Scientology world. But also, I really wanted to understand kind of what message was in the atmosphere for you growing up and how you kind of internalized that. So you might have that in mind while telling the uh, a little bit of the historical recap. Gotcha. So I'm the great grandson of L. Ron Hubbard and the grandson of L. Ron Hubbard Jr., who was the last Scientologist in my family. So Jr. rejoined his father after being left by him, basically, for his entire childhood as L. Ron was running amok, running amok through the U.S. And when Dianetics came out and L. Ron had this newfound fame and sort of fortune, then his son joined him to help build this kind of new business slash empire. And Junior was kind of his right-hand man and was his enforcer for many years. And they ended up having an enormous falling out, to put it mildly, and then they engaged in this war um, really to the end of their lives. And so when I was born, that Junior was actively in battle with his father in both the court and in the streets and they were getting stalked on a regular basis. There are multiple loose lawsuits happening. And Junior felt like he was a wanted man. He was sort of on the run in many respects and was basically felt like he was constantly dealing with the entourage and all of these goons that were following in his footsteps. That I mean, that Junior was one of 
his father's first enforcers and would muscle people and blackmail them and beat them up and whatever needed to happen in order to keep them in line. So years later, when Junior's meeting the next generation of goons, you know what I mean? To him, it was sort of just ridiculous to feel like he was battling with these kind of shadow clones and because he knew his father on a different level than they ever did. And so when I grew up, Elron himself wasn't talked about. Um, he was this sort of dark shadow that had fallen on the family and they all wanted to escape it. They wanted to get out from underneath it. A lot of them were going to be going into the military, um, were in the military by the time I was born. And so they didn't want to have anything to do with this crazy con man who was under investigation from multiple governments, was on the run, was, you know, had this whole army of, of intelligence operatives and private detectives and lawyers, and they didn't want to have anything to do with it. And Junior was very specific to his children, my aunts and uncles, that this was his war. He didn't want them to take it on. He didn't want them to pay the price, but he definitely felt that he owed his father, that he owed owed his father a bit of revenge, I feel like, and also owed the world the truth. And I think that he knew what kind of dangerous price he was paying, and he felt he owed it for a lot that he had done, and watching what his Scientology had become. And so those are a lot of the factors that were all in play by the time that I was born. And so I knew who Elrond was, um, and I was really proud of him. He was one of my childhood heroes because I wanted to be a writer when I was really young. And so when I would go into any bookstore, there he was. And my great aunt, um, Katie, who was Elron's daughter, she also gets kind of lost in the narrative a lot, partly because she didn't engage in sort of battle with her father. She loved her father and missed him as he completely just sort of vanished as he did and that she really wanted to have her dad back and that was not possible at that point i mean he had become this larger than life figure and had this complete apparatus to hide him and defend him and but she was a huge reader and so she would take me to bookstores when i was young and show me all these different books that Elrond had written and I would see his name next to Robert Heinlein and Isaac Asimov and I was really proud about that. I had no idea about Scientology, Dianetics, didn't understand any of that. I was too young and I think that they're also just didn't want to bring it to me if I didn't mm. ask. And then when he died, he died in hiding of course and he... And what year was, was that, Jamie? Oh Christ! Um, Around it, it it was the same. It was literally they announced it the same day the Challenger space shuttle exploded, mm. um, and so wow, I remember, I remember that, that as moment. Actually, I remember that yeah. moment. I was in elementary school. I remember them yep. stopping school and all of us standing there and listening to it. it That's right. Intense. Yeah. That's right. That I remember as a kid that we had current events. And so everybody was bringing in articles about the space shuttle explosion. I'm trying to find up the exact year because I always get it a little wrong. Sometimes I confuse the year Junior died and the year that Elrond died. And where is it? I can look it up That's on one okay. second. That's a good – if listeners really care, they can look up the date. <laughs> it's on Wikipedia in milliseconds. <laughs> I'm <And> sure. <laughs> yeah, to to be fair, I realized that there was a while ago that I, I told my brain to stop memorizing all of the Scientology minutia because it was just becoming yeah. overwhelming. I mean, I've had a real wrestling act, I think, especially in the past couple of years in terms of – how deep down the rabbit hole I want to go because yeah. I've had some pretty treacherous experiences um, going <laughs> down the hole. Unsurprisingly. Well, that, is actually, that is a line of questioning that I want to take with you because. Sure. Uh, we'll we'll go there. I'll, I guess yeah. this is the prologue. Uh, <laughs> 1985. 1985. Um, 1985. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. And they, they even talked about how 
Scientology and Miscavige was really grateful for the space shuttle explosion because of the fact that it sort of consumed all of the headlines and allowed them a little time to move in the shadows and make their power plays. Interesting. But as a kid, when that happened, I remember that being announced on the news and my mom's reaction to it was really bewildering to me as a kid, um, probably because I had always wanted to meet him. And I know that that seems so ridiculous to some people. If you know Scientology history, like knowing what I know now, like why doesn't Elrond come over for Christmas, you know? And I wanted to meet him and show him, show him my writing. And they were like, honey, he doesn't, he doesn't want to be found. And I had no idea what that meant. I didn't, I didn't understand that he was literally like on the run from multiple like nations, you know, and nobody knew where he was except for like four or five people. And I mean, he was completely off the map. We know where he was now, but I mean, there was maybe like five Scientologists or something that actually knew where he was at. And so in either case is that when he finally passed that I think my mom felt this almost like this, this weight off her at the same time as her own sort of sadness because it was her grandfather and he was gone and she wasn't really able to have a relationship with him either. And he left all of this ugliness and nastiness behind that unfortunately did not stop on the day he died. In fact, it just took a new turn and all the lawyers and all the investigators still came out and were trying to shut everybody up and silence them with a whole lot of um, different settlements and things like that in order to just close the book and move forward. Meaning so, meaning junior and your family members? That's right. Yeah. They wanted they wanted to basically so Junior at that point was in huge lawsuits with his dad. He was actually trying to flush him out of hiding. Yeah. Um, this is a really pivotal kind of moment in Scientology history. And he was basically calling their bluff. He said if uh, he said that I think that my father has either gone crazy or he's dead and Scientology is hiding it and exploiting his assets. Because Junior had enough of his fingers in the old sort of ways to know that there was a lot of murky stuff happening behind the scenes, which there was because Junior was also correct. At that point, Elrond had gone off his rocker and was completely lost in his own fantasy world. And that the power players and miscavages and so forth were moving behind the scenes and, you know, money and who controls the lawyers and who controls the investigators. I mean, that's where the real power is at. Right. When people ask me what happens, you know, when David Miscavige dies, I said, well, who has, who has the account numbers to all of the money? Who has the phone numbers to all of the lawyers and the PIs? That's where the power is at. You know what I mean? That's where the true source of all of your apparatus and, and your little strings for the puppets across the world. But, in either case, Junior was trying to bring him out of hiding and called their bluff. And that was a very frightening sort of pivotal moment for the people behind the scenes because they had a real problem on their hands in terms of what do we do? We can't bring Elrond out. We don't want the public to see him. He's completely lost. And I think it also really pushed the issue of what do we do next? You know, mm -hmm. that, that when he's gone... Who's going to be in control? What's going to happen to all this money, all the real estate, all of the organizations that own these copyrights, all that stuff? And Miscavige was savvy enough to move like a shark towards all that in, in a really clinical and kind of um, um, comprehensive way that I think other people weren't prepared for. He was hungry and he was ready and yeah. he saw his opportunity. And so at that point when Elrond died yeah everybody got hit with lawyers on their doorsteps like in the days after basically like you know signing non-disclosure statements here's a settlement take some money shut up and i really think that junior had such a personal war with his father that was a son and a father i mean they both had the same name he's named after him in his own likeness he was trained 
He was as one of the very first Scientologist auditors. He did a bunch of crazy like sex rituals with his dad. I mean, they had a really intense relationship um, in a short period of time. I think right when they were kind of at their peak in a way of L. Ron with at the start when he's flush with all this money and this kind of new power and he's starting on this path of Scientology and his son who was a really young beefy vibrant you know young man trying to make his way into the world and that was when their paths really crossed and so years later you know decades later when they're at the end of their lives and i think that that junior a lot of his battle went out um, after his father died because he didn't want to fight all of these underlings and all of the the debris and collateral of all these other little clones of Elrond when his war was with the real man and a man that he knew and that he had worked with and he saw behind the curtain and saw the ugly side of and then now he has to deal with David Miscavige and his pit bulls and everything and so I think at that point he just signed whatever they had and just was like I'm, I'm done with this which to me is the real sort of tragedy of the story um, but they came in and they were grabbing anything and everything they could any kind of documents family photos um, they did the same thing to my great aunt so there's I'm sorry a- Jimmy when you say that the tragedy of this story is I wanted to just really get what that was that the tragedy I, of the story is I think the, the tragedy of Junior was that his war with his father ended in an anticlimactic and sort of crushing way where mm. the memoir that he was working on, the lawsuits that he was working on, I think that he, well, he states it over and over in his memoir that he had a vendetta to write this memoir and give it to his father. Like he wanted his father to actually pay for his crimes and that what he had done and for to be exposed and to finally be brought into the light. And that never happened. Um, it's something I point out constantly when people reflect on the latest cult leader and this and that. As I always point out, Elrond never went to jail. He never saw a day of jail. By all accounts, he basically got away with it. He died rich and crazy, surrounded by acolytes on his own hidden little land. You know, mm-hmm. he had created fortresses in his honor and he had rode it out till his health collapsed and he was gone but he never paid a serious price for it i mean he never went to jail he managed to escape from all those governments that no matter how many exposés had come out and evidence had been come out and had been documented i mean he still managed to stay one foot ahead and i think that that was some of the tragedy of Junior, at least. There's a million tragedies when it comes to Scientology. <laughs> I mean, Elrond in himself is his own tragedy because I, I think in the end mm. that he was so lost in his own fantasy land that I think that he didn't... He, I think he most definitively was completely gone at that point because of what he did with Jerry Armstrong and that um, you know he le- even legitimized people going and digging back into his past, which to me shows that he at that point had lost all grasp on where he was or who he was. Um, Which is a whole nother story. There's so many stories and so many different alleys to walk down and sorry. I did, one go, que- down, I did go down that <laughs> rabbit hole when I saw you. One, yeah. One, it. one question <laughs> is I'm always just like, where do I start? And my, my little note to myself this morning was just like, all right, uh, make sure that you talk in paragraphs, take a breath, try to be cohesive because <laughs> it's also just sometimes when people ask me, there's so much to the story and it's, it's on so such much. this kind of epic, insane scale. And so much of it hasn't been told and hasn't really been, been thoroughly understood. Um, but in either case, the, the, <laughs> the short synopsis of that, of what did I grow up? What was that? climate right is that what you asked yes, what was the yes. sort of climate so that was really why i'm saying all these things is that all of that was sort of converging really at the time that i understood and was having a cognizance of who elron was that i knew that he was this fantastic glorious writer and i had all of his a lot of his books um i was given like a set of his early writings of mission earth series i had those in my little bookshelf 
And that was very inspirational to me, but no one talked to me about Scientology. And I would sort of ask my grandfather, Junior, <laughs> about him. And, you know, my mom and my uncles would be like, you know, leave, leave grandpa alone. You know, you can ask me, but leave him leave him alone. I didn't know that they was he was actively at war during yeah. that time. I just remember a kind of um, man who was, he just seemed haunted to me is how I remember him as a kid. Um, mm -hmm. That he just, he always seemed a little distracted that his head was somewhere else a lot of the time. And now I feel like I understand more. And it was only when Elrond died that I started to see a lot of flashes about Scientology and seeing that in the obituary notices and having people ask me about that as a kid and I only started learning more about it because I was such a hyper Christian kid that I was handing out pamphlets on street corners and I was a minister you know I wanted to be a minister but I was like a witness for God to get the phraseology right and I would see in these books about cults, all the cults that we need to watch out for. And then I would see Scientology and then oh, a wow. picture of L. Ron Hubbard. Now, because so, you have a, that was a, you were raised Baptist, correct? That's right. That's right. My mom, my, I remember being Baptist. My mom, like also Pentecostal, I was baptized, <laughs> all that. My mom would even kind of move from church to church. And there was even a period where we moved down to the Bay Area where we sort of tried out different churches. And there was some fucking weird ones that we went to that I've even now tried to identify like what the hell faction was that where <laughs> you know none of the women none of the girls would cut their hair and all the men looked the same and had beers like they were close to Amish it felt like but we were in a city I was like who the fuck were these people <laughs> so yeah I mean um all <laughs> uh Christianity that's a whole nother question we can get to that in a second um <laughs> But that was sort of what I grew up with, and that was the crossroads. And why all that stuff is important is because I think that there was the Elron when he was alive, which was really when I was a young child and starting to understand just just having a concept of him as like a heroic writer and an inspiration that I could triumph in seeing his name in a bookstore. And then his death, which led to junior kind of putting down his sword and just wanting to live the rest of his life in peace while at the same time you have this massive power vacuum and this new monster taking the reins of Miscavige and all of his goons and all that was happening kind of in this little moment that I was also this hyper Christian kid who was wanting on the path to be a minister and so I felt Absolutely. like I needed to understand all of the dangers inherent in the world that all of the uh, the little playthings and, and uh, uh, plans of Satan and the Antichrist and his armies. Yeah. And so those were in all my, my cult books. In fact, I still even have one of the cult books that I had when I was a kid. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it had – it's pretty much – it's typical Christian – cult kind of book where every other religion besides Christianity is pretty much a cult. <laughs> um, they'll like sort of give a little respect to Muslims. They've been just saying they're like, well, there's, you know, they are a religion, but <laughs> these are their cult like beliefs. This is why they crazy. So. so interesting that, you know, just to imagine you kind of, I'm sort of picturing you, you know, as this young boy wanting to be a writer and seeing the books in your, in your shelf and, you know, respecting and loving this figure who you hadn't really known. And mm -hmm. then you mentioned when he passed your mother's reaction. Can you say a little about that? You were saying that it was a moment for you. That I, yeah, I think, off. well, I think, I think my mom has always been it's interesting because I've asked her about this in many different kinds of ways, but um, be she put it really succinctly. She said that, you know, past all the Scientology, she's like all that garbage and all that toxic poison. She said, I lost my grandfather and my father to the same creation. 
Yeah. And she viewed that Scientology consumed them both and took them away from her yeah. so that she didn't have a grandfather. He was just vanished and was a ghost. In fact, he was a dangerous ghost that not only was he not around, but it's like he's attacking you from all different angles. He's making them move on a regular basis. Her dad was having to warn them about their grandfather and all of his emissaries and, and what to watch out for and to always be careful and to report if someone's following you, which they were. They were getting followed pretty often. Mm-hmm. And I mean, at the very least, I mean, from a children's perspective, they could sense that they were being hunted in different ways. And so that really made her have this kind of newfound dedication to family and family bonds. Mm. Um, and so she was really adamant that she did not want Scientology to affect her children's lives. So that was why she kept Scientology from us. She didn't want us to know or or be under that weight or start asking dangerous questions that could put us in a bad place or bring more attention to who we were. Because well, at and that that's point- gotta be that's got to be such a fear. I mean, just for the listeners, and we'll get into this a little more when we um, when I hear more about your story, kind of as you come out about mm-hmm. who you are and about speaking out about Scientology. But just so for listeners who don't know a ton about Scientology, I mean, to have that experience where you are essentially kind of on the run or feel like you're being watched all the time. I mean, it is just so rattling, so fundamentally kind of earth shaking to one's foundation. It really, you know, that's a very, very big deal. Yeah. I mean, if anyone has not had the sweet, delicious experience of being (laughs) hunted (laughs) by some sort of shadowy fanatic, let me tell you, it is not fun. It's (laughs) not fun. I mean, it, I've had people ask about it sort of, you know, like in bars, like, oh, what's it, what's it like, you know, and I'm like, you know, it's actually not fun. You know, there's, there's not a lot of James Bond feeling. There's not a lot of, um, there certainly is for the hunters. I mean, I've talked to people who have been that person who've been in OSA, the Operation of Special Affairs, and have run black ops, as they call them, on their critics and folks. And I think a lot of them, not so secretly get off on it the the sense of having this kind of divine mission and anything and everything is allowed in order to destroy your opposition and look i mean we all have lives that who wants to be followed and hunted and have someone digging through your trash looking for any secret any kind of weakness and if they don't have a secret or a weakness that they can find they'll fucking fabricate something and they'll make it up they'll do anything and everything that it takes because they fundamentally believe that you are in the way of the salvation of our race and our planet and that's what i try to explain to people is like you are not fucking around with someone who just disagrees with you this isn't like some red state blue state shit this is someone who like views you as you are literally In the way, you are an active opponent of the salvation of mankind and you need to be destroyed at all costs because you are killing children and killing souls and, you know, I mean, like you're basically destroying the planet. So what is it, like, what's the big problem with like destroying your life? You're trying to destroy the planet. So if I get you fired and get you bankrupt and get you put in jail or whatever, that anything and everything is necessary, you know, and that's always a dangerous aspect of, of cults, which you can talk more about, about what I, what I think are important components of cult mentality. And one of them is to have really clearly etched villains, to have your opposition yeah. that is always a shadowy, fundamental, you know, sense that they're always, you always need to have a clearly defined enemy And that enemy is active and they're always coming against you. So you always need to be vigilant. You always need to be battling. But also you get folks in an end justifies the means sort of mentality, um, which is is really, really key. You know, I mean, you think on think on as a Christian, how 
how much more I heard about hell than I ever really heard about heaven. Heaven was pretty nebulous. Oh, it's going to be great. There's going to be gold. There's candy. You sing a lot. Hell, though, is just endless details and pictures. And I mean, how many people read Dante's Inferno and never quite got to the heaven bit? Um, I didn't because I was like, what do I need to read a bunch of you know what I mean? Like hell's way more fascinating and interesting. Who's in hell? What are they doing to him? What kind of punishment? You know, and that sort of thing. And it's it's the same with Scientology is that it's not so much about I, I think it's the same way with all cults. And you make them self actualizing realities. You say the world is against us, they're trying to stop us. And then your cult leader is doing a bunch of shady, insane shit. So then the world is investigating you and is trying to trying to expose the truth and you're like see they're coming after us we got to batten down the hatches we can't listen to their lies we have to you know you start to self-police your own mentality no sad i am delighted to offer you pure haven products all proceeds received go right back to the project hope podcast i myself have been using these pure safe and toxin free products for over four years and i absolutely love knowing that my home has countertops that my little niece and nephew can eat off of without worrying that they have a handful of chemicals being placed in their mouths. The cleaning products are some of my favorites. Uh, The glass and surface cleaners smell amazing as well. So if this is of interest to you, please go to purehaven.com slash Jennifer French The link is also included below with information about this podcast segment. I mean, you see it happen over and over and over in cults. And it's the same with Nexium. It's the same with QAnon. It's the same with, you know, I mean, even in uh, uh, Jim Jones, for instance, that he would even make up um, attacks that when they were in Jonestown, there was a kind of pivotal thing that when people were about to leave Jonestown, they're just getting really impatient. And they're like, we're in the jungle and this is fucking deplorable and we want to go home. And he actually faked an assassination attempt against himself. He had one of his one of his cronies go off in the jungle and then like take shots at him and then he faked a heart attack. And then he's able to say, you see, they're coming. They're trying to kill me. They're trying to kill us. And everyone's like, oh, fuck. Well, we're going to stay and then we're going to and then they're like, yeah, we need more guns now and we need outposts to make sure that we block every and there's just a perfect example of the cult playbook and it worked. And I mean, no one left. They all stayed there and then guns were omnipresent and they're like, we have to we have to watch out for the outside world. And, you know, you start to just play their rule book. It's the same with Scientology is that Elron was getting hunted. People were trying to shut it down because they were like, this is a criminal sham of an organization and this guy's a fucking liar and i can prove it to you and you have to put it in people's head that they'll self-police it they won't look at it you know and that's just that's just part of the little magic sauce that uh that makes it work i mean that special sauce well you have to have all of that mental apparatus because one of the most important elements is getting people to self-police their own thoughts and the only way that you're able to do that is with a couple major components one is that um, you have secret knowledge so that they alone have been exposed and this they and the elite of this cult whatever the chosen you can replace it with a million different terms um the chosen the divine few the you know the one percent the whatever you want it to be but that they alone have been privy to this amazing secret so you need to hold on to the secret you can only talk about the secret with those in the know and there's usually a whole nother apparatus that is about what happens if you expose the secret to people who aren't ready for it um that what you've had to do to earn those secrets you had to go through some kind of ritual you had to pay some money you had to go through some retreat whatever Mm -hmm. and so you're part of this chosen few but then there's usually always once that starts to happen, which is kind of the carrot, then, you know, the stick is like, well, this is what happens to the people who have not been exposed to it. Right. Then mm-hmm. and, and they're going to live terrible, sad lives. And within them, there's people who want to take what we have. 
You know, they want to stop it. They want to take away the good, the secret. They want to expose it, whatever it is. And then that way, when you're not at the church or whatever it is, you're already policing it. Exactly. Exactly. It's like there's the indoctrination into Mm -hmm. the belief system. Mm -hmm. Then one starts incorporating that into themselves. And so it's amazing to me that then even if you are out in the world and kind of functioning, even in a job with people who are not a part of that organization, your mentality already is completely protected in the special sauce. Exactly. And then, and then you have a clearly etched enemy. So when someone is like, Hey, I just read a time magazine article exposing L Ron Hubbard that has all of these different, you know, they're going to say, Nope, you're an SP. I don't need to hear it. Um, that it's basically woven into the theology of Scientology is an example that it's actually, um, will, will toxify your mind that if you read it, that if you read this other information, that not only is it toxic, but then you actually will have to pay to remove it from your psyche. So then they'll just never read it. They'll never read it. And so you see it with uh, QAnon and the fake news and all of that is like you put it in their head early. So then they just automatically self-censor it. They'll shut it down before they even allow it to come in or have some sort of critical thought. And a lot of that is that you just always build up your enemies to make them so vivid and and detailed and give them these like really crazy ulterior motives um, that are often kind of weird mirrored versions of the leader's actual motives, but they're like woven into the enemy's motives of what they want to do and and, and great point and, and the world that they want. And so then you just automatically shut it out and then it becomes self-fulfilling right it becomes self-fulfilling so you know q anon is there like the godless pedophiliac democrats are stealing the election and they've won because now all the media which is fake is announcing that biden won and that trump lost and they don't you can't even it doesn't even matter what you can show you can have them in the room and they can be counting votes and it, they're not going to believe their eyes because they've already been told and they believe that all of this is an apparatus of lies. And it is shortly after the election. So whenever you're hearing this podcast, <laughs> forgive me if I take a couple swipes at the QAnons and so forth. But it's just another perfect example. Like when I see Nexium or I see QAnon and I'm sure the next cult is out there right now and someone is brewing up a same plan. It is. And <laughs> Nexium is almost just like someone literally just studied the shit out of Scientology and was like, how do I just replicate this? Well, and, and even it, for them, I mean, some of their, ter- some of their uh, terminology is even the same. Like I do think they use the word suppressive. Oh, do they? That's awesome. I think so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they have they have so many so many different elements that are the same as Scientology. Um, you know, Elrond they call Source, and in Nexium is Vanguard, where yeah. he's not quite the Messiah, like he's not God, but he is the smartest, bestest human that has ever walked this earth. And I think actually Nexium's biggest mistake, I guess if we can call it that, is that they were not clever enough to pull Elrond's greatest devilish trick which is to declare themselves a religion that's the only reason why scientology is still fucking around that's the only reason is that they've been able to hide behind it ever since that they converted it and it you know and that's that's ultimately about money and ownership of properties and money and tax exempt status because they're that's exactly right getting exactly right members it's really about yeah and that's that's why also when anytime Scientology wants to come with the typical religious bigotry angle, which is what they use, um, they always say that anybody is, is a critic of Scientology is a religious bigot uh, or a Nazi. They'll usually throw out Nazi somewhere in there, even though the fucking uh, <laughs> the Sea Org was modeled off the goddamn Hitler Youth. Um, but I digress. Is that? <laughs> I digress. Is that that they, uh, where was I? That they, uh, oh, oh, that it started as a science, right? It started as a science, similar to Nexium, where they say, here's a genius, which is L. Ron Hubbard, and Nexium has Keith, yeah. uh, and that 
here is one of the smartest, greatest men that have ever lived. And his mentality is so far past yours. And here's a whole fictitious bio of amazing heroic exploits of fill in the blank bullshit of why he's an incredible genius. Um, therefore, he has made all of these discoveries, which is this new kind of revolutionary science that only this guy has come up with. And the other sciences are trying to shut down. So whether that's psychology or spirituality or whatever else, that they're trying to shut us down because we alone have the answer. You need to pay a bunch of money for these courses to indoctrinate your brain or condition it in order to accept more of our strategic courses. And they have the upper echelons, which is very key to cults and Scientology and Nexium. It's like you earn your way up. So you have that same chapters of secret knowledge that you're unlocking. So you feel more and more elite, more on the inside, more I have this knowledge that no one else on the planet has. So that gives you a sense of pride and ownership. It also is at the same time, um, just complete the, the side effect is that it's also creating a level of shame that's going to become monumental when you do try to look at all of this and feel like it's false or that you've been lied to the whole time. And in Scientology, when they throw this religious bigotry angle is I always point out to them is that you're not a religion. You didn't start as a religion. Elrond never said it was a religion when he started. They literally only changed it when they started to get hit with lawsuits because they were perceived as a fraudulent bullshit science. They said, you're a science. Where's your evidence? There was no evidence. Where's your case studies? There were no case studies. There was, he made this shit up. And so they weren't able to survive as a science, the same as Nexium, right? And Nexium, this basically, they didn't make the Scientology change in the crossroads. Um, so any future cult leaders, you know, heed this advice, I guess, if you also want to be a soulless, parasitic piece of shit. But they turn it into <laughs> they turn it into a religion. And then forever after that, that you don't have to the word fraudulent doesn't come in there into religion. Proof well, doesn't come in there in a religion. Right. You know? Or or it can get the label of um like I think with Nexium, the validity was kind of in the psychodynamic element, right? That right. we've got Nancy at the head here and she's a legit therapist. And we have right. you know, discovered how to create this information in this most perfect way, channeled through or delivered by Keith as well. And and they knew they knew creepy psychological shit. I mean, that's what's interesting is the stuff that they actually knew. Um, I, someone can add this, I'm sure, in the comments of the podcast. But their like initial actual stuff that they knew psychologically involved a lot of neuro linguistic programming yes. and these other aspects that they're actually using on you. Same with Elrond was actually a hypnotist, and the, he ended up trying to bury a lot of that. He hypnotized people at like book readings and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. It was like his happy little parlor trick, and then he hid that later because he knew how bad it would look that you're asking a hypnotist to basically put you in a trance and then to like have you tell them about all of your past lives and et cetera. And you're just going to – any a lot of logical people would be like, that sounds like I'm just opening my head up to whatever you want to put in it, which is exactly what it's doing. That's why they have to hide it. You don't want Keith and Nancy to telling you like – what is your main specialty? Oh, my main specialty is learning how to program your brain with language and uh, rhythm and control. You know what I mean? Like, no, they're not going to say that. Okay, Jamie. I'm going to. It's like I'm the reality of their actual skill set, <laughs> which they are trained at, is then buried while they're selling you a whole nother skill set. You know, so, that's, so I've got to give you. Trick. Yeah, I've got to give you a nugget that is in alignment with exactly what you're talking about. So my personal experience, which was a spiritual flavor, um, it's so funny because the, um, oh, I just forgot exactly what I was going to say. The We're talking about skill sets and their actual skill sets and hypnotism. And oh, yes. And okay. So this is going to crack you up. So the leaders of my organization, male and female, were both psychotherapists at uh -huh. some point along the way, but it was a spiritual organization. So at some point along the way, 
the male leader, Peter Bowes, who is still, um, who still has his little crew following him, he actually revealed that as his thesis research paper, he did it on group dynamics. Wow. Well, if you know group dynamics in terms wow. of therapy, you can manipulate group dynamics. And I remember it actually occurring to me at the time that like there was a little tiny glimmer of a spark in a bulb that went off just enough so that I remembered it after I left. But That's isn't amazing. that fascinating? I mean, really, you know, the other thing that happened for me when I left was I had been under this guise, of course, that these two leaders were directly connected to God, that their mm. word was the word of God, that it was essentially the truth and it was a clear channel. Yeah. And I will never forget <laughs> after I got out, this is another kind of funny anecdote. I mean, I apologize to people because every time I laugh or sort of giggle about something, it's like funny, not funny. <laughs> But I was driving and I was listening to a radio station and there was a psychologist that came on and he was taking calls. And this young man called in and he was asking advice about the relationship that he was in. He hadn't spoken for more than 30 seconds. And this psychologist stopped him and mm -hmm. said, have you had this kind of history where around this age, your mother did this to you and you've been in this dynamic for this amount of time? And he absolutely nailed it. And this guy was kind of blown away. You know, I mean, he really nailed the, some details about the kind of psychological history of this guy. And in that moment, I went, oh, they knew psychology. I thought. They, they were getting the direct wisdom from God, but they knew psychology. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah. lately I'm going to now and it is what it is. It's a little underhanded, underhanded parlor trick um, <laughs> is a little element that they have. It's, it's always, there's always, you know, there's always some sad sort of bleak, mediocre, very human and very understandable skill behind the magician trick yes. you know and there's usually a, just a very not that exciting and not particularly divinely ambitious goal that's this kind of supplemental goal towards whatever that is that they say that they're doing whether that's real estate they get to bang a bunch of their members they get to have an open marriage be and only them you know what i mean um they just just these are the perks that come with it and it, it makes you wonder sometimes on which came first you know i mean how much of it was driving one or the other or if it's just kind of its own side effect of the control, you have that much control. So why not add in the extra? We need some more money. You know, will you will you sign me over your house or not? I mean, yeah. you just kind of see them get corrupted along the way, yes. which isn't really that surprising for a lot of p folks with sort of like untouched, unvarnished power are usually going to do something pretty awful with it in some degree. Um, but, but it's funny. I think that that is actually a point that a lot of people don't understand, especially mm -hmm. if you've kind of gotten in in the beginning or you have seen these people speak. I mean, sometimes, you know, a lot of people have said about Keith Raniere, for example, but he just seems like kind of a goofy dude. You know, like upon first approach, you're not going to think, oh, he's the mastermind of some great cultic event agenda happening here. Mm. Um, but I do think that that's something that people don't quite understand is that there really is a shift in a lot of the leaders with time and power. Oh, yeah. I mean, who knows what would have been next for Keith Raniere's next magic trick. I mean, he was obviously on a path on seeing what else he could get away with and the kind of sexual perversion. But it also depends on like, what is your your persona that you're selling? I mean, Keith was selling this sort of 
passive aggressive CEO style. You know what I mean? Oh, and so good. It, Nailed it. And it's also because he's not, he's not, a, it's not a religion. So you're still trying to convince people that are, are, urban professionals for the most part and that's the kind of language that they respond to you know they sort of respond to the you know let's let's intermix spirituality with sort of corporate terminology and a lot of the goal is about self-actualization and you making more money and you being more successful you know so i mean that was how he even kind of ensnared allison mack right was basically on on become more successful with your career, become a better actress, that sort of thing. And then, of course, what happens, they end up getting completely sucked in and she quits acting to become a full-flung member and, and that sort of thing. And, I mean, Elrond's whole selling point was that he was, like, a great explorer slash scientist. I think that that was something that really kind of obsessed him. And when you look at all of his early sci-fi stories that – the heroes, that's what they were. They were sort of swashbuckling explorer types that it wasn't that they were just a scientist in a lab, was that they had gone on ships to great far reaches of everywhere and had found hidden alien technology or or whatever. But I mean, that sort of like swashbuckle pirate quality, like going around and finding all the secrets of the nation and the world and using them to unlock this new mental alchemy. Like that was his whole hustle and his whole like sort the, of the adventurer hustle. explorer element to exactly. the avatar. Well, and also if you just, if you always look at their fake biographies, you can see what kind of flavor are they trying to sell to you? Yeah. Um, with Keith, for instance, it was all about that. I'm an Uber genius. I yes. mean, it's like in every bio is that, I was in college by this age. I could speak before this age. I could play piano. I could do, you know, it's just like I'm an amazing prodigy that the world has very rarely, if ever, seen, right? And Elrond's is that I am one of the most learned men with the most exciting and storied life. You know, I was the first Boy Scout champion and the first casualty of World War II and a submarine commander and this, that. And he did have a relatively exciting life. It's just he was also burning a lot of bridges and failing at a lot of those things (laughs) as well. (laughs) And if you look at his bio, it's that he was literally victorious 100% of the time at every single one of those goals. You know, like this physics class is a perfect example. And the sci-fi biology, uh, psych... uh, sci-fi in the scientology sorry it's too many ologies <laughs> it is scientology biography of his physics class they he was a you know like an honor roll student and it literally has paintings of him in the scientology like elron life exhibit of him at the board like writing out all of these amazing formulas and equations as this like young red haired guy. And there's all these other elder scientists in white lab coats looking at him like, my God, I think he's got it, you know, and that sort of thing. And so that's what he's selling. And then in real life it's, he flunked the class and showed up for like two of them. So (laughs) it really shows in a perfect example of his psychology though, is that he would just transform anything that was a failure immediately, not only to, I took that class, which was true. He did take a physics class, but in his mentality was that, and then I was the best that had ever done it. And they were all learned learning at my feet is a perfect example of his kind of psychology and how they twist it. And to both of them, to both Elrond and Keith, for instance, is that, um, and I just find that they're good, easy parallels in some degrees. And, um, I hope that there's ex-Scientologists listening to this that are enraged at the comparison because you still have some sort of latent hero worship for Elrond. But is that if you look at both of their biographies, their biographies are so key to the collapse of the entire theology of it because everything is based off their fictitious biography. If Elrond did not do any of those things that he said, if he did not past the physics class then he doesn't know anything about physics and he has no right 
to tell you why he's developed a new science. If Keith is not the amazing genius that he said he was, um, then he is also not the person who should probably be telling you about a new science that you're going to be programming your brain with. And so it's so integral that they fight for that fictitious biography, um, why L. Ron would fight for that, why Scientology still fights for it, and they still insist upon it, because otherwise it all falls apart. You know, and that's something that I still wrestle with when I talk to ex Scientologists who try to find the good in in Scientology and the courses that they took. And I'm sure there's people with Nexium that have wrestled with, with some of that as well. Well and actually I'm like, really what? curious, Jamie, because I think that this is something that comes up for a lot of people. And as you've been speaking about kind of these leader figures my mind very much goes to some of the gurus, the spiritual mm -hmm. gurus who came to the United States bringing these teachings from India and these spiritual mm -hmm. lessons that the U.S. really hadn't awoken to yet or forms of yoga and things like that. And right. it very much is in alignment with kind of, you know, especially during that time, I mean, when that big boom happened, kind of 60s, 70s, right? people weren't going to India and checking the information. Exactly. You could say whatever you want. And, and the biography sells, starts to sell itself and become self-perpetuating. The way that people talk about Keith, the way that people talk about L. Ron Hubbard, the way that people talk about a lot of these figures is that they're like, well, he was, you know, with L. Ron, they'd be like, he travel the world and he was like a nuclear physicist and he made all these discoveries and he was an amazing writer and he was went to world war ii and he was a submarine commander and then he came back and he learned this new science you know it's all it's all part of the narrative that all leads to this great moment of discovery that then you're going to take on and, and, and continue. And that stuff is, is integral. I mean, it's stuff in the sixties. Yeah. That would be like, he's from India. You know what I mean? You could just start it off with that. This whole like otherness, this whole other culture that has this spiritual quality of it, you know, et cetera. And I, I've just always said to folks when, um, like when it comes to Scientology as an example, is that remove the man from all of it. That if you are finding something in the theology that is resounding with you, um, probably nine times out of ten, he stole it from someplace else that was actually effective. Um, or there's other, like an underlying actual other skill set, like the hypnot hypnotism. Um, but there's also these other social factors that are created when you're kind of constructing the cult apparatus yes. that are also just as addictive past the theology. And I mean, one is the sense the community. of community. Yeah. The community, the sense of purpose, um, yeah. also self betterment. I mean, that's Absolutely. something that, that I think some people don't get. They're like, why do people join cults? And I'm like, look, a lot of times people, what Scientology is selling you, what Nexium was selling you is that, do you want to be a more efficient self actualized person in control of their emotions? who's working to their optimum level. Most people are going to say, yeah, that sounds great. I mean, I'll say yes to that. You know what I mean? Like, like if someone's like, Hey, if you do this, this, and this, and be like, okay, that sounds, that sounds great. Um, however, when it's all based off one person, um, or whatever that is, then yeah, you should fucking scrutinize that one person. You know, you should figure out where is the person in this because those, that person almost always has, different ulterior motives or, or you know whatnot the other easy thing i just say and i unfortunately bring this to about everything in my life is if you want to know the true story of any organization or any cause or community is just literally follow the money because that is you'll find out the true story right away yeah. you know what i mean like you'll know what are they really about who's profiting off this how much, you know, is this dispersed? Is it actually a communal effort or is it all going to the top? You know what I mean? What happens with that? You'll find out the true story of it right away. Same with Nexium, same with Scientology. All that other shit aside of like what we need to do, where's the community, right. all of the us, us, them, all that, just shed all of that and you follow the dollar bill. I mean, that's what the FBI does. You know what I mean? They want to know what a criminal organization does. You want to know the real story of it? 
Don't look at how many bread baskets they give it on Thanksgiving in the community. Figure out where's all the money going. Well, you know, and, and interesting that you say that and even use that kind of analogy of like a, um, uh, you know, like a mobster kind of family organizational yeah. uh-huh. thing because the, um, I think it's the prosecutor is the right term for Keith Raniere, who's representing the U S mm-hmm. against Keith. Um, they actually put together, I believe their whole argument around thinking of him as mm-hmm. a mob boss mm-hmm. and then having that first line of DOS slaves as kind of his, you know, the, the mob family. The, it, the yeah. Circle. Like the, the inner circle. Wow. That's interesting. I never wow. thought of that. I, I didn't, yeah, I haven't heard that, um, I mean, Nexium is also really interesting in the fact that I wonder if they would have fallen at all or fallen so hard if it wasn't for the sex slave branding, which Absolutely. is going to get picked up by every media organization it is so horrifying and so, so just like tantalizing, though, to so many people. Um, that they're like, oh, that's a sex slave thing, right? You know. Yeah. And- in fact, Jamie, you know, if you hear the the guy who wrote the New York Times article that was kind mm-hmm. of outing the whole thing with Sarah Edmondson coming on with the photo mm-hmm. of her brand and everything, yeah, yeah. he mm-hmm. actually talks about that. He said, if the brand hadn't been there, mm-hmm. we wouldn't have really had a story, and and it wouldn't right. have been this big. I mean, there are so. I mean let's get real. I mean, you and I know it's like the cult next door, right? There are cults right. all over the place right. in almost every little nook and cranny. And right. there's obviously a spectrum of destructiveness around that. But Jamie, I do want to get back to, I'm very curious what you were saying. Um, so when you talked about Scientology and mm talking to ex-members who are getting out. And I was kind of thinking of this whole guru phenomenon where um, I recently interviewed Pamela Dyson, who kind of has blown up the Kundalini yoga community coming out with a memoir this year and revealing that this guru, Yogi Bhajan, um, that she claims that he uh, had sex with her. And this is not what his messaging was to the community, When that came out, essentially, they have now, um, they basically hired an organization called the Olive Branch that is a Buddhist-based organization that comes in when there are scandals like this to receive the stories of the community. So through this, there have been a lot of people that have come forward with abuse stories of all Mm -hmm. sorts. And it's extremely disturbing. And it even goes into, you know, the second gen of these yogis that were following Yogi Bhajan. And he told them to send their kids to live in India, in a school in India. And so these children were raised and have many, Mm -hmm. many stories of serious abuse. So this brings us back to this question. It's very interesting for, oh, and so by the way, after I got out of my cult, a few years later, I decided to do kundalini yoga teacher training. So I myself am a kundalini yoga certified teacher trainer. Um, however, because of my previous experience, I definitely was having red flags go up. I think the difference now in that community is that you have kind of the old guard of people who were raised in Yogi Bhajan's mindset. Mm-hmm. And now this huge new crew of people coming in kind of as I did, where it's just no longer the same type of feel around the community. And so what's been very interesting, because I'm a teacher, I am privy to a lot of these internal discussions that are going on within the community Mm -hmm. and people having a very hard time, you know, going, I will never do this yoga again. Or, Uh, you know, I've created my whole life as a teacher and charging for this type of yoga. And how do I feel about this? And can you separate the yoga from the man? It's taking, it's take, taking the good stuff from it and removing the people 
yeah. and the power and the control and all of their ulterior motives out of it, right? Growing up Christian is the argument constantly is like, well, Christianity is good, good things and, you know, love thy neighbor and, and so on. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. That's some of the good stuff. But what about the lake of fire that all of us burn in eternally and eternal torment for every single person on the planet, including every Native American before all of the explorers got here, every Alaskan before we got to get up there and get him a Bible are all burning endlessly in hell. One, one of my favorite points, Anne Frank burning in hell right now. She went through the Holocaust, lived in an attic, but she was Jewish, didn't get a chance to read the Bible, burning in hell forever, eternally. Like (laughs) that is just some, that is a controlling mindset that it was put in there and was written by people, was written by men, mostly almost entirely men. And even the history of Christianity, it says something that's always frustrated me is that people just don't, they're not even Beautiful curious. Example, by the way, I just have to pause there. I'm like taking it in like, ah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just that, that as someone who grew up Christian is that I wanted to understand the actual historical roots of Christianity. And I've said this story many times, but is that I was always really, really moved. I mean, I was completely just, transfixed by this moment that my grandmother showed me a a flower that she had picked on the field of Armageddon, the actual field of Armageddon. Mm -hmm. And as a child, she had it framed in this enormous Bible that she had that she would have me read all the time. And it just made it so real and so tangible to me. And I would start reading endlessly about the book of Revelations, the end times and so forth. And just trying to understand and decode it. And because they were really trying to make it this reality of the Antichrist was was literally coming at any second. And it was this holy war that we were all preparing for. And then to really like understand the historical underpinnings of Christianity and that like that so few Christians are even interested in reading about it. You're so insistent on Jesus being a real person in this real time to the fact that we've made every single thing that's ever happened in our history dictated off this one person. That's how we measure our years now. And so what? who were the other people during live during the time? What were the other historical documents during that time? And then like, boom, when I got to points of understanding the Council of Nicaea, for instance, it's just like that made so much raised so many doubts and questions to me of wanting to understand, well, what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? What are the Essenes? What are the, you know, all of those things that I was trying to understand as a Christian. And it made it very clear and rather obvious that it's like the state, you know, administered version of Christianity, also the translations of the Bibles that were absolutely done by people. And they're even named after fucking kings, King James Version. It's like, well, who was King James? Isn't that important? If you're talking about the word of God, then who is the, you know, et cetera. And so, but it's, it's like people, it's too easy to believe what the person is selling you. And what they're selling you is that it's not a man that wrote this, that this is some other divine knowledge that I'm a conduit. That's usually the easiest way you sell it, right? Jim Jones is a conduit. David Koresh is a conduit. Elrond is a conduit. That um, there, I'm not God, because that's always a hard thing to pull off. That you're God. Um, I'm not God. Yes, but you, if you've got past lives in there, Jamie, then you can throw in that you. Oh no, the, you God. can do that all day. You can do, <laughs> do that all day, and then you can be a God also if it's past <laughs> lives. That's what they do in Scientology. They're like, we were all gods. You know what I mean? This life. I'm still L. Ron Hubbard and you are you, but we'll get there. You just got to pay more money. Um, but you make yourself a conduit and then that way you're just like, I don't have to understand all of this. I'm just speaking through this larger force, et cetera. But usually the conduit is is the the part that you should look at because they are excusing all of this stuff and you're like taking away, what is this person, this conduit, this man usually, what are they getting out of it? And it's usually an element of control. It's usually money and sex and land and, you know, all of the other basic shit that is, is pretty pedestrian is not that exciting. Um, and, and they also are usually like half fucking crazy. I mean, like you can't, that's something that gets discounted a lot. People are like, well, did Elrond know it was a lie? And, and you know, et cetera, is that it is so, it is such an exhausting job 
to be a cult leader that like you're in those sessions all day like elron is writing all of those books he's auditing all the time like keith is in those nexium sessions like that shit is a lot of work so i mean they either at some point believe it themselves or they you know jim jones would preach for like eight hours you know he was on a shitload of speed but i mean he would still preach for eight hours like they don't just take the money and run because they're also they got skin in the game you know they're invested and so um i i just have always found that 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 is the problem is instead of looking at it that all of these different theologies are mixtapes you know there's someone grabs some of this that grabs some of that you know christianity grabs some zoroastrianism they took uh you know they have for hades they take even satan as a goat is like you know dionysus and whatever i mean they just they they take the different holidays and they mix it you know everything is a mixtape so like some respects just take stop listening to one person saying that i alone have the answer and you need to pay me a price for it just listen to what they're saying and take some of it that you like and then fuck you know make your own shit so grateful to Jamie for the time that he's spent with us on the Project Hope podcast. I found my time with him especially interesting because of these layers that he has experienced in his own life as part of the legacy through his own biology in terms of Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard, the ways in which that's affected him and his family. Um, Also that he was raised in a Christian family and environment, and then sorting through that on top of his legacy. um, Also that Jamie really has been a voice that has been really um, critical, I think, in terms of people getting to understand Scientology from the perspective that he has. And so he is a really unique voice. Um, I find him as a person also so enjoyable to speak with, very thoughtful, and again, that he's really uh, contemplated a lot of these things. So I hope that you have enjoyed our time together. Uh, We discuss and cover so many things in this this podcast and in the two-part series, Uh, but hopefully... Some of the highlights you might find are in relation to Jamie's discussion about following the money. I thought that that was um, especially interesting for those of you who maybe have a loved one in an organization that is potentially not that uh, discovered or is slightly unknown I thought that that was a really excellent point that people can kind of hold on to if you're in discovery mode about the group. Um, Also, he discusses um, the manipulation of one's biography as a cult leader um, and taking kind of the good stuff, removing the person, um, look at who the conduit is for the teachings, Um, and I loved his, um, comment that theologies are mixtapes and, um, that is very interesting and certainly within kind of the spiritual world, the new age world, um, even the classic religious world, uh, there are so many overlaps, so many similarities And so just an awareness around those who are claiming complete uniqueness or originality. I found those points very helpful. I hope that you have too. And please join us for part two for the Jamie DeWolf Project Hope Podcast. (laughs) 